Bonjour. What do you think of when you think France? Surrendering? <laughs> what do you think of when you think France? Amazing architecture? One of the best football teams in the world? This kind of bread? Well, what I think of is their amazing automobile and racing culture. Some of the biggest car manufacturers in the world are based in France. Many racing legends race under French licenses. But only two privateer teams joined Formula One based in France and had some semblance of staying power. Over the next couple of videos, we'll be talking about both of these teams. Let's start with the more successful of the two. Today, we discuss the history of the monsters of Magny Cour, Équipe Ligier. Guy Camille Ligier was born in 1930 in the town of Vichy in France. He was orphaned at the age of seven and left school in his mid-teens to be a butcher's apprentice. He played rugby in his youth and was good enough to play for the French National Reserve team for a time, but retired early because he couldn't stay healthy. After rugby didn't pan out, he entered the construction business. In 1960, he acquired a backhoe and a bulldozer and with the money he made as a butcher's assistant and with the help of Vichy Mayor Pierre Coulon, he founded Ligier Travaux Public, a roadway construction and maintenance company. Essentially, he was doing the DOT's job for them, because God forbid they do it themselves. His business rapidly expanded, and after just a year, he had 1,200 employees and 500 machines, and had expanded to building bridges, dams, and house development. Through his public works business, he had made friends with local socialist politicians Francois Mitterrand and Pierre Bourgeois. Those names will come up a lot later. If he wasn't on the job or playing rugby, Ligier was racing. He started on motorcycles, winning back-to-back -back French motorbike championships in the 500cc class in 1959 and 1960. He broke into sports car racing in 1964, driving a Porsche 959 to sixth place at Le Mans that year with his teammate and friend, Joe Schlesser. In 65, he got into rallying with Ford France, driving a Mustang 359 to sixth place at the annual Rallye de Route du Nord a rally race that is still being run to this day. Over the next three years, he'd try his hand at Formula One. In 1966, he entered a Cooper Maserati in five races with a best finish of ninth place. 1967 was more successful, as he scored his first and only world championship point at the German Grand Prix. He retired in 1968, the reasoning behind which is another story within itself. Before the 1968 Formula One season, Honda had been working on a new wonder car that was light, just like what Lotus was doing. Aluminum, the metal of choice for many teams, was too heavy, titanium was too expensive, carbon fiber didn't exist yet, beryllium was toxic, and lithium, potassium, cesium, and sodium were too soft and burst into flames at the touch of moisture. So, they decided to make the car out of magnesium. Now, if you've taken any chemistry class ever, You'd know that if you set a strip of magnesium on fire, it burns very, very hot and very, very bright. They built the car out of thin magnesium panels, and this led to a machine that John Surtees took one look at and said, that thing's a goddamn death trap. Surtees refused to drive it, but they fielded the car anyway at the French Grand Prix, with Joe Schlesser behind the wheel. Schlesser crashed on lap two and since race cars usually burst into flames whenever they wrecked back in these days, the car, several dozen gallons of high-octane aviation fuel, and Schlesser's body were all incinerated. The fire burned at over 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit and brighter than the sun at some points. Since you can't put, a, put out a magnesium fire with water, the fire crews had to wait for the car to burn itself out. The race continued for five laps as Schlesser was cremated in his own car. Ligier would stay in the racing and automotive industry as a constructor instead of as a driver and named every car he built JS and then a number after his lost friend. He hired automotive designer Michel Tetu and built three cars, the prototype JS1, a race car with a Ford V6, the JS2, a road car with a Maserati engine, and the JS3, an endurance prototype. With a stake in the automotive industry achieved, he bought the assets of Equipe Matra in 1976. Matra had a star-studded history in F1 before Ligier came in. With Jackie Stewart and Jean-Pierre Beltois behind the wheel, 
Matra became the first team not based in the UK or Italy to win the World Constructors' Championship. They had scaled back their footprint in the sport by 1976, last producing engines for the Shadow Team, but with Ligier's money and the services of car design wunderkind Gerard Ducarouge, they could re-enter F1 full-time under a new name, Equipe Ligier. Using his friends in high places, he got sponsorship from state-owned companies in France, such as the oil company Elf, the cigarette brand Gitan, Norep diecast cars, among others, struck a deal to use Matra engines, and hired young gun Jacques Lafitte to drive the new Ligier JS5, known as the teapot because the airbox made it look like a teapot. Lafitte and the big blue car with the gypsy lady got off to a hot start, scoring three podiums in 1976 and scoring the team's first win at the 1977 Swedish Grand Prix, the first time an all-French team had ever won a Grand Prix. They expanded to two cars in 1979 and won three races with Lafitte and Patrick Depaillet, finishing third in the Constructors' Championship. In 1980, they finished second with a strong showing out of Lafitte and Didier Peroni, scoring two wins and nine podiums including a couple 2-3 finishes at Kyle Lamy and Paul Ricard. Also in 1980, Francois Mitterrand became president of France, so if they weren't sitting pretty already, now they really were. Mitterrand essentially ordered state-owned companies such as Gitan to sponsor the team in bigger ways. Tobacco advertising was banned on television and billboards at the time due to Le Loire Veille, passed in 1976, but Mitterrand cut them some slack on this, allowing them to run Gitan colors and logos on their cars. They were censored on TV, but they were still able to get the money. Ligier's early success and the re-emergence of Renault in the sport caused a massive spike in interest in F1 in France. More drivers would spring up in F1 at the time backed by Renault and Elf, such as the aforementioned Depaillet and Peroni, Jean-Pierre Jarier, Patrick També, Jean-Pierre Jibouy, and René Arnoux. By 1983, though, Ligier had run on hard times, scoring no points and finishing 14th in the standings. Mitterrand essentially forced Renault to give them free engines starting in 1984 while giving them first dibs on supply, while also ramping up funding from Gitan and Elf, while also bringing in the French National Lottery to sponsor the team. Ligier had now essentially become the French National Racing Team. In 1984, they rebounded, scoring 3 points, then going up to 23 points in 1985, and then 29 in 1986, good enough for 5th in the standings, before Renault then withdrew. A partnership with Alfa Romeo was inked after that, but didn't make it to a race weekend, as René Arnoux went all Fernando Alonso on their asses after one testing session. Then BMW, rebashes Megatron, came wrong for a year, then Judd, then Cosworth, and then Lamborghini, before Renault finally returned in 1991. After Renault left the first time, Ligier cratered. One point in 1987, zero points in 88, three points in 89. In 1990, they went scoreless, but still finished 10th due to one of the most interesting moves in Formula One history, which we will also cover in the second part of this series. LaRousse had finished sixth in the Constructors' Championship with chassis built by Lola. The administration at LaRousse mistakenly entered their constructor as LaRousse instead of Lola, which was untrue. They didn't build their own chassis. It's the same reason BMS Scuderia Italia was referred to as Dallara legally. Due to this crucial admin error, LaRousse was disqualified and scored zero points. Ligier, who had placed 11th in the standings, was now 10th and got the travel subsidies and prize money that came with placing top 10 in the Constructors' Championship. Some of you that may be more conspiracy-inclined may think that this is really convenient, as Ligier was in good graces with the French government, and they may think that the president of the FIA, Frenchman and noted Nazi Jean-Marie Balestri, was in on it, but that's likely not true. I don't think, anyway. Even after Renault returned after 91, they still couldn't stop the bleeding. Williams was also getting Renault engines and were dominating throughout the early 90s. Ligier was not. The French National Lottery was still supplying money, but they requested that the logos be removed from the cars, as they wanted to be associated with winners. I know this is coming from the French, but that has to be the most Italian thing I've ever heard. And keep Ligier's well-being seemed to be reliant on Francois Mitterrand staying in power. He was re-elected in 1988. 
They got another lifeline at the end of the decade, as the other of the two friends finally showed up. Pierre Bourgeois had become mayor of Nevers, a city with a racetrack in it, the Circuit Nevers Magnicourt, which was now in a state of disrepair. Bourgeois and Mitrand had made a friend in the area, the widow of the owner of the track of Magnicourt. They had hatched a plan to revitalize the economy of the area through racing, upgrade the track, create jobs, pump more money in, move the French GP from Paul Ricard to Magnicourt, everyone profits. Some allege that part of the reason why they decided to upgrade Magnicor was that Mitterrand had a mistress in the area and making so much noise would help people forget that that was a thing. He was giving people jobs because she was giving jobs to Mitterrand if you smell what I'm cooking. Am I allowed to say that? I don't know if I can say that. Ligier moved base from Vichy to Magnicor in 1989, and now they have a test track, a new HQ, a new wind tunnel built by Simtech, among other goodies made out of the deal. At around this same time, a new law had just passed through the Elysee Palace. Loi numéro 91 à 32 du 10 janvier 1991 relative à la lutte contre le tabagisme et l'alcoolisme. Sure, or in simpler terms, la loi est bon. Previously, I mentioned that tobacco and alcohol advertisement was banned on TV and billboards since the 70s. But this law called for the prohibition of all tobacco and alcohol advertising everywhere, even at sporting events. This meant that Ligier couldn't get sponsor money from Jetan anymore, putting an end to some of the most beautiful liveries in Formula 1 at the time. La Russe, other race teams, and all of the soccer teams in Ligue 1 that had alcohol brands on their kits applied for compensation for the money they would lose. Nobody got the money they were promised. Guy Ligier was probably told about this ahead of time, and sold the team for 200 million francs to businessman Cyril Derouve, while he stayed on in an advisory role. The Derouve era of Ligier didn't last long, as he was indicted for fraud in 1994, and sold the team to Flavio Briatore and Tom Walkinshaw. Now that the team was owned by an Italian and a Brit, La Loi Evon could be circumvented through a loophole in the law, so Gitane could stay, but only subliminally. The team improved under Flavio and Tom, scoring more points in the occasional podium with drivers such as Martin Brundle, Mark Blundell, Eric Bernard, and Olivier Panis. The team was essentially run as a B team for Benetton, as Briatore owned both teams simultaneously. Ligier's 1995 car, the JS41, was a Benetton B195 in everything but name. In 1996, Gitan logos disappeared from the car, and were replaced by those of their less cool-looking sister company, Goulwa. The team got his last win at the 1996 Monaco Grand Prix, as Panis finished first out of three finishers. Briatore and Ligier sold all of their shares in the team to Formula One legend Alain Prost in 1997. This could not have happened at a better time. Mitterrand's successor, Lionel Jospin, was soundly defeated in the 1995 presidential election, and Bourgeois had shot himself after the Socialist Party lost big time in the 1993 parliamentary election. Ligier's buddies had completely fallen out of power. The new president of France was Jacques Chirac, who was close friends with Prost. Prost struck some deals with Chirac to get some preferential treatment, like a Peugeot engine deal and sponsorship from French companies, just as Ligier did with Mitterrand and other socialist politicians back in the day. Ligier, now known as Prost GP, was now playing the political game in France on the exact opposite side of the political spectrum. Clever. The team had one more year of sustained success, with Panis scoring two podiums and securing P6 in the Constructors in 1997. In 1998, they only scored one point, as Jarno Trulli finished sixth at Spa. Trulli scored the team's last podium in 1999, finishing second at the European Grand Prix. Panis and Trilli would both leave the team after 2000, and were replaced by rookie Nick Heidfeld and Jean Alessi in the twilight of his career. They scored no points that year. By 2001, funds had run thin, and they relied on a revolving door of pay drivers including Gaston Mazzacane, Thomas Enya, and Luciano Berti to keep the team afloat until the end of the year. Alessi scored four points before leaving the team for Jordan, and he was replaced by Heinz Harald Frenzen, who had just been let go from Jordan. Prost finished ninth in the Constructors' Championship, an improvement over the previous year, but it was all for naught. As before the 2002 season had begun, 
Frost GP had gone bankrupt. Despite Alan's star power as the owner, he couldn't raise enough money to get him out of debt. Reflecting back on this time, he referred to this endeavor as the worst mistake that he had ever made. With the money that he had made from the sale of his race team, Guy Ligier entered the agricultural industry selling fertilizer and made up another fortune. The Ligier name returned to racing in 2004 with the JS47 Formula 3 spec car. Ligier Automotive made many different endurance cars in the 2010s, ending with the JSP320 in 2017. Guy himself passed away in 2015 at the age of 85. Flavio Briatore would continue running Benetton after selling his stake in Ligier, and continued in an executive role when Renault took over the team. He is now blackballed from the sport due to his involvement in the Crashgate scandal in 2008. Tom Walkinshaw invested in Arrows after leaving Ligier, an investment that didn't last much longer than Prost GP did, merging with Minardi after the 2002 season. Alain Prost was the former driver's representative on the FIA's board of stewards from 2010 to 2012. He joined forces with businessman Jean-Paul Driot as an advisor for his Formula E endeavor, E-Dams Racing. Alain's son Nico raced for the team and finished third in the driver's championship in 2015 to 2016. He most recently held an advisory role at Alpine, leaving the team in 2022. And so that marks the end of Equipe Ligier's time in Formula 1, but that does not mark the end of this series. Next time, we'll discuss the other of these two teams, La Russe Formula 1. Thank you for watching. I have been Bobcat 205. Au revoir! Thank you.